Hello, I'm Matt Peterson. And I'm Rich Trapier. And this is episode 43, 44 of History on the Table. It's like amateur hour, except it's like the weatherman when they... Uh, Anchorman, I mean, when they put the question mark. No, I was, I was of thinking of Mr. Script. Mom. 43, 44, whatever it takes. I don't think I've ever seen Mr. Oh, Mom. Oh, gosh, yeah. You're too much of a baby. I guess so. How's it going, Rich? Good. How about you? Great. I feel like we've, uh, and, and I mean this in the best way possible, we've had a lot of each other this month. I know, and we're going to get even more each other next month. That's right. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to, Rich and I have alluded to it a little bit, but this February, uh, we're doing a little lake lake house con uh small gathering um we're gonna play games thursday friday saturday and wake up sunday morning and maybe try to squeeze in one more game yeah i'm really looking forward to it we actually were gonna do this a couple years ago you were like the organizer of it and then you couldn't make it so we just did it without you (laughs) yeah yeah well this is uh i'm looking forward to it it'll be a nice getaway uh a good time Hopefully the weather's like perfect getting there and like crummy while we're there and then perfect to get home. Yeah. You know, like I want it to snow on Friday and Saturday and then be all clear. Yeah. I'm not driving myself, so I don't even care. Mitch has a big truck. Oh, there you we'll go. We'll be fine. Yeah. <laughs> perfect. Yeah, that's gonna that's gonna be a blast. Uh yeah, but we had our December episode get pushed. We had a here I stand game, we had our best of the year, and now we're finally back on schedule. It's January's episode. We're talking small games tonight. Absolutely. Small game January. That's right. It's like dry Will January, it be a but more we'll fun. See. <laughs> yeah. Hey, that's not a bad idea, Rich. <laughs> we'll see, we'll see how they come out in our ratings. Yeah, fair. Uh, a couple of cleanup things, or not necessarily cleanup, but just intro things to get out of the way. Historical board game awards ballots will be going out hopefully next week. Um, I don't want to be too ambitious, but uh, end of January, early February is when we promised them, and I think they're close. How many people so do we'll you be... have on your judges list? Like twenty, thirty something? Between that, it's okay. right around there. I don't know I don't remember the number off the top of my head. Something like that though. Okay. Yeah. Fifteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty two, twenty five. Okay. Yeah, right in there. So Yeah. So those ballots will be going out, and then as soon as we have all the judges ballot, they'll have February to vote. We'll get those back, and then we will get the public ballot out to get the twenty twenty two historical board game awards awarded. Nice. Not as prestigious and not as important, but just as fun. A little update on the Every War Game Ever listener vote we are running on our Discord. So if you're unaware, more or less daily, I try to do it Monday through Friday. We have a daily poll um, that's a bracket of every game Rich and I have discussed for the Every War Game Ever. And this is the listener chance to prove us wrong or voice your opinion. I guess. And so far, we're just in throws of round two. There haven't been that many upsets, just with how, you know, you have a lot of, like, matchups that are going to be blowouts anyways. Right. Yeah, it hasn't been crazy yet, but it, it's coming. There's definitely some contrarians in the group. <laughs> I will say one of the things that did surprise me, it was not a technical upset, but Men of Iron, um, which has, you know, been a sad moment for a lot of people, fell to Normandy 44. 13 to 12 was the vote. Yeah, and Men of Iron, that's a that's a fan favorite. It's got a, uh, you know, that's like the 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 plucky underdog that everybody loves. And I think the only technical upset where you had a lower seed winning was recent, and that was Blitzkrieg Blitzkrieg Legend upsetting the 10 seed Silver Bayonet. Yeah. I don't agree with that, <laughs> but I understand why, and that's cuz Blitzkrieg Legend is an OCS. I just think there's generally more fans of OCS than than Silver Bayonet. They that might be sense. wrong, but that makes sense. Yeah, so that's that's where we stand. Yeah, we talked about we talked about Vietnam or uh, sorry, not Vietnam, Silver Bayonet recently. I think we talked about it a couple episodes ago, but I I feel like that's one of the games out there that I know I like, but there's still a lot for me to find out about that game. Yeah, agreed. So going into uh, midway through round two, we have a couple people that could still score in the 50s. Um, Someone who didn't properly title their ballot, uh, (laughs) titled Based on Hot Preferences and Not My Own. We have our buddy Todd's pick, 
Wardrobe. Go check out his YouTube video. He's in second place with 33 points so far. I uh, could still get 53 uh, right picks. Bill is in fourth with 31 points. Then it was based on hot preferences at 32 points. Todd, Wardrobe, 33 points. And the Command Tent with 34 points. Um, yeah, that's that's how things stand. I am near last. So. I'm in the bottom five. <laughs> and I did not submit once. I'm in the did not submit ballots boo category. On, boo on you. So that's how it stands. We'll be doing that. And then when that closes in March, we're going to do a new thing. And I'm really excited for this one. Yeah. Same bracket, same kind of deal, except it's blown up every, I shouldn't say every, best war game series fan vote. Oh, that's right. Yeah, we were making a huge list. So how many did you get up to? We were we were talking about getting up to 128. Did you get that high? Like just I'm not a list g- of series. Just series. And we've, for sanity's sake, <laughs> and to not start a debate on what is and isn't <laughs> too a late, series. Too late, too late, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is just it a series? Is it a war game? The eternal debates. So I have I have a bunch that I need to add that people responded with on, on Twitter. But right now, so we've dropped the tactical World War II stuff. So no ASL, no um, Bands of Brothers, mm-hmm. no ATS. Yeah. We're at seventy five. Okay. So there'll be there'll just be some buys. Have I mean, we're plans, really yeah. scraping the bottom <laughs> of the barrel. It was kind of fun seeing the list expand, though. Oh yeah, I'll, I'll say this too. Like the first sixty four was easy. Yeah. And then now you're getting some like really odd odd stuff in there and it has been fun like is international game series a series or is that just a grouping for mmp to sell things and yeah i don't know it's so fun. how are you going to get their initial rankings just purely your decision no I, I might do one of two things if it's if it's just like something i've never even heard of i'm going to give it a low rank for mm-hmm. things that i have heard of and have a chance of being the top i'm going to go based off the highest ranked game of that game series based on bgg's rank so for oh, example yeah so the Twilight Struggle series of Cape, Cape of Africa and Imperial Struggle, that'd be first, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks, we have a podcast. We're going to talk about war games and stuff, and we're just going <laughs> to... I don't think Integrates With counts as a series. Oh, my gosh. It is a series on BGG. Holy smokes. Oh, is it really? I didn't even know that. I was just messing with you. <laughs> okay. What do these three games share in common? 1989, Dawn of Freedom, Imperial Struggle, and Twilight Struggle. Because apparently that's a series. Well, I'm surprised. They did. Isn't there like a... There's one called like Cape of Africa or a little one or... The new one that just came out. It yeah. probably just has a bit updated okay. on BGG. And then is there an Afghanistan game? A bear, bear Trap or something like that? Is that a Twilight... No, that's based on Sekigahara. Sekigahara. That's right. Okay. I knew it was based on no. something I couldn't remember. No, I'm not. Sorry, but no. Vito. Okay. <laughs> you can you can cons- submit your complaints to uh, Mitchell Land at complaintbox.email.com. All right, so that'll Seriously be fun. typing right now. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we'll do that in March. All of those things, the daily vote, the every, no, I keep saying that, the best war game series ever vote, that happens in our Discord. There's a thread for it. It's fun. And people are so gloriously wrong. <laughs> about so many things discord is the place to be that's right all right that's our that's our upfront stuff oh that's a nice little it's not even a segue it's just a tease yeah anything else rich uh no no let's get all right it. so it's it's dry january you know for you it was not for me I've i've actually been dry since halloween really yeah yeah what? Uh, there was like a week after, and then I started having the stomach stuff. It's completely fine now, but um, you're gonna be dry in two weeks. I probably, yeah, really? right. yeah, it's it's fine. But to say all of that, I apparently have also been dry on board game port- purchases. Although one of these I see on here, I I got as well. I just forgot to list it, okay. and that's Next War Supplement Three. Yeah, yeah. So uh, yeah, I, I picked up a few, which kind of surprised me. I wasn't really preparing to buy this many, but 
Um, Drop Zone St. Mary Glees. I can't remember when MMP put that up. It was not that long ago, but this is a historic ASL game and it just looks awesome. And it wasn't even that much. It's, it's not as big as some of the other ones like Festung Budapest or Red Barricades or anything. It's a smaller one. Uh, so I got that one and that one came in actually just today, I think so. So that's new to the shelf. Um, I did pick up the newest, so this is the first time I've ever bought a C3i magazine. Um, so C3i Magazine Edition 36 uh, came out, and it has a game in it. It's a North Africa game that I will certainly play, but mostly I bought it because there's some Pacific War stuff in there, like counters and articles and stuff like that. I barely even looked through it yet, but when I saw that there was Pacific War stuff in the new C3i, I picked that up, and I've got that one. Um, similar to you, I did get Next War Supplement 3. That was one that I p 500 it a long time ago or whenever uh that one showed up in the last month and then the last one was a total surprise for me i was at half price books with my daughter and there is a copy of gunslinger oh for baby 50 bucks i'm like that is awesome that's uh, that's that has been one of my games that i've been wanting to get a hold of for a while so i actually took it up to the guy i'm like I, i'm gonna need before i buy this i need to look inside it and make sure that everything's in good order so i mean obviously the game is like 40 years old so it it's not um you know it, it's been punched and played but it looked like everything there's there it looked like everything was in good shape so i now have a copy of gunslinger yeah so for those who don't know gunslinger is a old wild west tactical game avalon hill that is game. Just, yeah avalon hill game it's just bonkers it's bananas it's it's tons of fun um where it just yeah every game i've played has told an amazing story like i kind of remember you and i getting in like a a shootout where we're both laying on the ground bleeding out and i think it was duck or something like just came in and grabbed the the gold and left (laughs) yeah yeah so it's it's essentially uh a very tactical game with role-playing elements to it so you literally play one person and you might have a gun you might have a bow and arrow whatever but you play one guy and there's there's facing and you're looking at stuff and there's timing like I need to reload my gun or I want to aim my gun or I want to drop to the ground, all these things. And then things get, you know, I think it's what, like five second intervals you play the the game in, something like that. And then someone adjudicates it based on what cards you played and all that. And ultimately you, I don't think there's dice. I think you pull cards or something to see if you hit people and stuff like that based on, you know, uh, how close you are and how good your skills are and whether you aimed and all that. But that's the game and it's just it's a lot of fun to play and there's so much in there that i haven't even played like there's huge scenarios with yeah. buildings and you know tons of people and it's fun I, i'm looking forward to playing it some more yeah and you manipulate like a hand of cards yeah. and when you play a card i think there's something that like lets you pick them back up but it's been a while since i played mm-hmm. but you you do combine those in in the time allotment you have um and it's, it's yeah. just a hoot. so like it's, if you it's, and it's i are facing each other and you play your shoot card and I play my aim card, you know, we're going to get to the first second in that five second interval and yours comes up first and you shoot me and it doesn't matter if I aimed if you hit me because I'm just going to die. Or maybe you'll miss me and I'll hit you because I took the time to aim. I I found a copy of this, uh, I think, shortly after we played at that one um, Donkey Kong. Uh-huh. And it's in fantastic shape, except for the ran- – not random, like the player aid cards. Yeah. Whoever owned it before me put them in, like, plastic coating. What's that called? What, why can't I think of it? Not like zero laminated? Odds, but... Yeah, that's it. They laminated oh, the player aid cards. probably yellow by now, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But yeah. everything they didn't laminate is, like, pristine condition. Huh. And I, it's just like – so people don't laminate. You're just, one, <laughs> you're not going to play the games that much anyways. And two, it's it's just not. Don't do it mentioning going back to c3i real quick i have this as well i just got my shipping notice and you talking about reminding me Mm -hmm. same i'm the exact same i'm interested in the curse game already north africa is what makes it more interesting it's the same system as that and then the pacific war counters yep Yep. so that's just on the way for me cool awesome that's a that's a pretty sweet haul yeah i was really surprised that i got that many because i wasn't really planning on it so you know some of them obviously i purchased a while ago i think the the gunslinger was the biggest surprise and drop zone st mary glees i was happy to get it now i guess i ordered it a month or two or whenever ago very good all right let's talk about some books yeah how about you you want to go first yeah sure i mean i don't have a lot to say about because i just started i was going through 
I'm in like a purge mode, so I'm clearing out books, I'm clearing out RPGs, and I'm about to get to the game. So mm -hmm. keep an eye in the marketplace for those. <laughs> uh, this, So I posted a picture of some of my uh, historical nonfiction stuff, and I said, all right, what should I read next? And Sicily 43 was recommended, and so that's what I have started. This is So this is my first James Holland book. I know you're a big fan of James Holland, both him and his podcast. Yeah, and I've read one of his books as well, but I can't think of which one offhand right now. But I did like his reading quite a bit, and I love his podcast. Yeah, his podcast, so... by the way, is called We Have Ways of Making You Talk, and it's mostly about World War II. Sometimes they do other stuff, but like 95% World War II podcast. Yeah, so I'll just say, like, it's good so far. It's uh, – I'm – I'm doing this one on paper, mm -hmm. and so it's just taken me longer to get to it than I, I – or I don't get as much time to spend with it as I would like. I do like James Holland a lot. I will just take the chance to plug The Rest is History, which is his brother's podcast. Right. I, yeah, I listened to that one too. And that will sprinkle all around the place. Like, yeah. There's a couple things here on World War II recently, but they – yeah, his I mean, just brother is an even more concept. prolific author than he is. His brother is Tom Holland, not the guy that plays Spider-Man, but the other one. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, I, did I know he was an author, too? I don't know if I knew that. Yeah, so I've read a couple of his books as well. He's written... Um, the one that I r recall right offhand by Tom Holland was the one about the Greeks and the Persians. I think it was called Persian Fire, and okay. that was excellent, yeah. Oh, it was good? Yeah. Okay, nice. Mm -hmm. So that's cool. Do not accidentally buy Tom Holland as Spider-Man by <laughs> Katie Kawa. That would not be a book by Tom Holland. All right, what about you, Rich? Uh, so I'm reading Sand and Steel um, most of the way through it. This is by Peter Caddick Adams, who mm -hmm. um, I know a few years ago we had a little book club and we read Snow and Steel, which is his book on uh, the Battle of the Bulge. And to be honest, I found that one to be a little dry. This one I'm liking way more. And I don't know why. Um, I mean, I... I, I there's little things about it. Like he, he talks from time to time about what the ground looks like right now. Like, you know, he, when he talks about Pegasus bridge, he's like, well now, you know, there's a cafe there and the original bridge had to be, you know, um, had to be renovated and everything in like the sixties uh, or something. And when they, when they built the new bridge, they actually took the original Pegasus bridge and moved it to a museum. So there's lots of things where he talks about what the ground looks like now, who lives in the area. Now people, you know, like, Oh, this cafe owner was a, uh, was a child, you know, in France during, during the invasion. And um, it's just, it's just really well written. It's, it is very detailed. It's a, it's a big book mm -hmm. and that way it's similar to snow and steel, but I think it's uh it's more entertaining. I think, um, and now I'm at the part where he's basically just going beach by beach. So I just finished up the two American beaches and we're getting ready to start on the, uh, the Commonwealth beaches, which really is why I wanted to read it right now, because we'll talk later. I've been playing the greatest day, which is, uh, a, a D day game about the, the three Commonwealth beaches. Very good. I have his Monte casino book. Yeah. And I really want to read that. Although he wrote that before Snow and Steel, Sand and Steel, and Fire and Steel. Fire and Steel is his newest one. Okay. What's that so one? I'm a is little, that Pacific? Or that's just the end, end of the war. Oh, okay. Gotcha. So I'm a little... One, Monte Casino is super interesting. We need more Monte Casino games, folks. We really do. There's not many of them just out there. Italian and in general, probably. Probably. And I don't know if there's much recent on it i guess i could check bgg but i just don't think there's much recent monte casino stuff if i'm wrong send me it i want to check it out yeah um so but it was it was written before that and you're right snow and steel was just so detailed i enjoyed it but it was a bit of a, a bear to yeah. read all of it but someday i'll check it out yeah cool 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 all right let's get back to games all right all right kansas city historical gaming group i think we started back up in November, uh, but with two youngins, it's hard for me to make them, but I specifically set aside January's as the uh, one I wanted to go to. And today we played up front, which is timely because we're going to be talking about a tax up, which is from the same designer, Courtney F. Allen. Okay. Uh, this is a classic. It right? is, this yeah. is a This is a game you hear talked about a lot, especially like on uh, BGG war game side of things. It's you know, in the top 50, probably top 25 of BGG war games. Uh, it's tons of fun. There was some drama around it when they tried to reprint it. And I think the guy like absconded with all the money or something mm -hmm. like that and did some sh shenanigans on Kickstarter, but you can, you can get a print and play version from war game vault. And it's this 
tactical World War II game, except everything is abstracted. It's a lot like what I think Tank Duel is like. It's obviously a lot oh, okay. like Attack sure. Sub. And then also, I was talking with our buddy Rex afterwards, or I guess during, and my little experience with Combat Commander, I see what Combat Commander is like trying to do. I think Combat Commander borrows from this a lot, mm-hmm. but this is all abstracted. There is no hex encounter map. Right. But it, it is. it does have a surprising amount of decisions. It's tons of fun our our first two goes through the deck were really interesting our last go we were kind of like locked in position and so then it was a lot of like all right discard draw see what happens but it's light enough that i don't care that i'm spending my turn discarding because it's like all right new cards all right let's see what happens mm-hmm. it's it's very good good yeah lives up to the hype so there's a, a guy here in the st louis gaming group that brings that to miniature market every single month so yeah. I've seen it on the table at least twice in the last year. He plays it a lot. Um, I haven't played it yet, but I'm sure I will at some point. You should. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and it tells a great story, too. Just without even a map to look at, you know, we had guys flanking each other. And let's say someone starts to move and they're, like, currently in the woods. You can drop a piece of train. And it's like, that's not a that's not woods you just walked into. You just walked into a marsh. Yeah. And, oh, yep, yeah, you stumbled into some wire. Uh, and so it's, yeah, it's cool. We did a basic infantry-only scenario. We didn't use any ordnance and tanks. But it's got a lot of... Is that the game where you have to have a certain card to open fire? I know there is Well, there's, a... like, a fire card. Okay, but, like, if you don't have it in your hand, you can't shoot? Yeah, right. Okay, yeah, I've heard that about that game, so. <laughs> but it's different than Combat Commander because, I don't know, I was never bothered by it. Yeah. You know, I think it took us, I got there at noon, I think we were done by three, you know, two and a half, three hours maybe. Yeah. It's good. Okay. I, cool. I really recommend it. I think a real copy is, you know, upwards of a hundred plus dollars, but like I said, you can go to Wargame Vault and get a, a printed copy, uh, and it's a really nice production. Cool. Recommended. Yeah. Yeah, the guy that brings it to St. Louis all the time, you can tell it's an original copy. He's got, like, this <sighs> box of, you know, he's actually the guy I played Titan with a few years ago, a couple of years ago. Oh, and, it, nice. like, everything in his box, nothing is less than 30 years old. So, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'm going to print a copy. I don't know if I'll go, like, full ham and all the expansions, but just having, like, the base game and mm-hmm. some tanks. Because, like, you can get, uh, I think you can get North Africa stuff and you can get uh, Pacific stuff. It, it's cool. Cool. Yeah. Um, we restarted our Paths of Glory game. I talked about that a few months ago, and you yeah. know, I've been wanting to play an extended game of that because it seems like all my games always peter out after a turn or two. And started playing online, and then I just ran into, like, he could roll nothing but sixes, and I could roll nothing but one, and France capitulated, like, halfway through the first turn. And I'm like, well, this game is stupid. So <laughs> um, finally, you know, I told him, I'm like, I'm going to get back to it. I just need some time and space first. So we got back into it, and we finished up the first turn of that game, and it's going more according to plan this time. So I'll let you know how that goes, but we are playing Paths of Glory again. Very good. All right, we've talked about this game a lot over the last month, and that's Pacific War. I think what I'll do just going forward, look, Pacific War, if you want more information on it, check out our last two episodes. We talked about it a lot. I think I'll just share like how the whole strategic game is going. Um, so we play bi-monthly on this, uh, first and third Wednesdays. And so I think I'll just give a monthly update as, as we play, because it, it'll be interesting, one, to see how long we stick with it, and two, how does the strategic game play out. Mm-hmm. And so far, uh, two interesting things have happened. One is we're using some optional rules, and Japan sent a submarine to the Panama Canal. Right. And it requires a double zero roll, so they have to roll and then roll again, and both have to be zeros. But if they get it, it delays all allied reinforcements like a whole turn. Yeah. Like, it's a pretty big hit. And so, of course, they rolled zero, and then they missed. And then I think the next roll is like, all right, let's do one more roll and see what happens. I think I rolled a zero or something after that. So it was close. But more importantly and more realistically, uh, we're in the opening salvos, and I really thought they were just like going to go straight for pearl harbor mm-hmm. but japan has established a foothold on in the philippines mm-hmm. and is getting ready to kind of kick the philippines ass hmm. okay cool so that's that's where we're at nice. and we'll see uh we'll see how it goes we play you know a couple hours like i said first and third wednesdays and i'll just give monthly updates nice so philippines are under attack and that's where we stand nice um i've got a whole list of games that i have played like 
not even a full game turn of like maybe a, you know an an action sequence of or something like that. So I just list them out, but it, it seems like I'm playing a lot more than I am. Um, I did start a game of Brazen Chariots. We're like one activation in, um, but I'm looking forward to playing that one because I like BCS and I haven't played that one yet. So um, I think that's the only BCS game I have not played at all. So I also started playing a game of Stalingrad 42. And, Hell yeah. And we're like, I mean, all we've done really is the initial German attack. So not oh, very so far good, into though. that one at all. Yeah, I'm playing the Russians. So I'm just going to be moving backwards for a little while. Mm-hmm. And then I eventually assume that a million Russian guys will show up and just overwhelm Germany. That's the way those usually go. Um, hey, hey, real quick, yeah. are you playing that? You're playing with Zach on yes. play by email. Is yep. that what's going on? Yep, that's cool. what we're doing. So, yeah, so if you guys want to follow along, I mean, it's on the Discord. We're just exchanging files. You can certainly look and make fun of all the decisions that we're deciding on. So, um, Patrick and I actually did finish up our game of Reds, which we had been playing that one for a while. So, that was fun. Uh, as the Whites, I ended up pulling it out. I, Oh. Um, yeah, yeah. It was funny because the the last day that we played, like we knew going into it, we're like, you know, we're close to the end. We're just, you know, even if it takes four or five hours, we're going to finish this game tonight because we're close enough. I went into it assuming, I mean, I would have put like 10 to 1 odds against me winning. And, uh, <laughs> and, and I think Patrick would have said the same thing. That's the position we were in. But he had some bad rolls, and Poland entered the war, and the game just like turned on a dime. And he ended up like, th- you know, three, four turns after we started playing. He's like, I don't think there's any way I can win this game. I'm like, you know, you can just concede. We don't have to play it to the bitter end. But it was obvious at that point. I mean, Poland was going to take Moscow, if not the next turn, the turn after. So it was pretty wow. much over at that point. Um, so yeah, it it, it it got crazy. I think the the thing that got me the most about the entire course of playing that game, it was just so swingy in a good way. Like there were at the beginning of the game playing the whites, I'm like, there's no way I can win this game. And then a quarter of the way into it is the whites. I'm thinking, yeah, I got this. I'm going to win this game easily. And then halfway into the game, holy crap, the reds are all, they're reinforcing <laughs> so fast. I've got no chance. And then, okay, I'm about ready to lose. And then I win the game. So it's, it it's definitely a game that keeps you engaged because you do not know who's going to win. And it's not just that it's swingy dice rolls. There's just, I mean, that's part of it because you have to rally certain guys. The Russians have guys that just keep coming back and keep coming back. I think he knew that I've won the game when I, when he was ready to concede, when I killed his, uh, his, his big train. So there's a, I think a Lenin train or I can't remember what it's called, but there's a train that gives automatic rallies to everyone next to it. But if I can take that game, he never gets it back. And when I got that, he's like, okay, we're done. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I enjoyed the game quite a bit. Uh, yeah, I think we already rated that one last year. We did. Um, but yeah, I enjoyed it. Would play again. We're going to start playing something else next week. So. It's super fun, and that's like a joy of, you know, a, some of our patron picks, it went with the specific picks, have yeah. been games I would have never, ever tried. And this is a GMT game that yeah. I didn't even know existed until this. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's a super fun yeah. game. It's not perfect. I mean, it's it's yeah. probably a little too long for what it is. You could cut off a third of the map, and it would basically mm. be the same game. But overall, it's a fun game. Nice. Yeah. And then the other game I've been playing, and this is getting ready for Donkey Kong in a couple months. There are seven of us. Imagine trying to get that logistically together. Um, seven of us are getting online and is sort of pre-playing the invasion for uh, the greatest day, Gold, Juno, and Sword Beaches. So this is the GTS system, Grand Tactical Series from MMP, um, and it plays... You know, everything on those three beaches and south, you know, into like the German reinforcements areas. So we're playing, we've got, I guess we've got four allied players because we've got one for each beach plus the airborne. And then I guess there's three German players. To be unsure, honest, I'm not sure how they're splitting it up, if they're doing it by formation or segment or whatever. But for the most part, we're just doing the landings right now, the airborne landings and the beach landings, um, which is going to continue for a while. And that's our goal is by the time we all get together in April to have that part of it done. So we've been playing it through it and... I can tell you this GTS, it's it's definitely gotten my attention. This is a pretty sweet series. I'm enjoying yeah. it quite a bit. So um, I think I mentioned it before. I have the Crete game. Um, so I'm going to get that out probably, definitely sometime this year. I'm not sure when. And then there's, I can't remember if it's, I think it's an Omaha game 
is in development at MMP. I don't think it's even up for pre-order yet. So um, when that comes up for pre-order, that'll probably hit my radar as well. Utah may be in development. I'm not sure, but um, right now you've got the three beaches in one game, and then I think they're going to do the two American beaches as separate games. But ultimately, you will be able to put them all together if you're insane. Uh, I saw a picture of what it's going to look like. Like they didn't, obviously the, the last two games aren't done yet, but they took some maps from, I think their battle of the bulge game and just put them out there. So you can see what the size is going to be. This guy was standing on like a second floor balcony, looking down at his living room. And it's oh. like 25 feet across 15 feet deep. It's, it's way bigger than even Atlantic wall from Goss. Wow. So I'm never going to play it that way, but it's, it's definitely fun. And I mean, you can, you can play a single beach and it's not that big, but it's a really fun game. Never say never rich. <laughs> yeah. That's what. Donkey so the Kong good news, the good news is if you're interested in this series or reinterested in getting into it, cause I got into it a little bit and sold a lot of it off mm-hmm. is there's a new briefings magazine version coming out and it's, I pulled it up. It's fourth armored against Pen- Panzer Lair on the SAR. And that's kind of intended to be a good gateway in okay. to the GTS series. It's uh, one mapper, two and a half counter sheets, and that's it. Um, kind of like what they did bucks. for the Goss series with the the magazine game. Uh, yeah, sure. And MMP has yeah. done similar things. Like, I mean, lots of people have. So this is yeah. If you're interested, you can check that out on Multiman Publishing's website, GTS Briefings Volume One. Cool. Nice. All right, you got one more. Yeah. No, we, we have this one, one together. More. Yeah. All right. Let me talk about it. Or I'll start at least. And that's here I stand. <sighs> how this to, was. How to go, France. <laughs> one of the most. <laughs> I love Here I Stand. But man, if it gets piled on thick on you in particular, oh, yeah. I don't think I ever want to play France ever again. Yeah. Yeah. So I've played France several times in this game. Usually, because France has a way to get easy VPs, they take an early lead, and once people realize, crap, France is like a turn away from winning, then they jump on them. They just jumped on you on turn zero. (laughs) Yeah. So here's part of the problem, is I was fortunate enough, I think after turn one, to make peace with the Pope. Thank goodness. (laughs) But the Ottomans, they didn't go into an alliance, but they declared peace with the Habsburgs. England declared peace with the Habsburgs and was largely working with the Habsburg. It sure felt like oh, Rex will probably were, yeah. swear up and down that they weren't, and it just happened to be. And then somehow it became France's fault, who was <laughs> down in the mud and kicked and kicked again when they were down, that the Habsburgs were allowed to run away with the game when their biggest yeah. opponents still standing were at peace with them and cutting deals. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It was, it was brutal. I mean, if, it really was. if, uh, if the Ottomans don't keep the Habsburgs in check, then there's, yeah. I mean, he just ran across France when at, at that point, I don't, did you even have anybody left in France to stop him? I know he took Paris and, just ran across it. I mean, he actually won because of the automatic victory condition, which is when you completely use all of your key markers. So I, I think I've seen that once in the 10 or 15 times that I played. So I got really close to that. Uh, it came down to a battle roll, um, yeah. as England and I, I didn't win the battle. Yeah. Um, so if you're unfamiliar here, I stand is a six player brilliant game from GMT. It's card driven. The, the combat and everything is actually very straightforward. Um, you can use the cards for your uh, the events, or you can use them for ops. It's a shared deck, but every faction is very different. And well, I shouldn't say all of them are very different, but because some factions do play kind of similar, but the Protestants play very different than England, and, and yada yada yada. Uh, it's a game that really comes down to negotiations and just shit talking. I mean, there was a lot of it uh, today, and it like I will go back to this game in a year. But I probably will not pick France. Um, <laughs> and it's if you haven't experienced this, I highly recommend it. And so at Historic Fest, I think Virgin Queen is already on the calendar. And depending on how things shake out, I want to play one of these in person. Either here I stand or Virgin Queen. Yeah. I think there will be chances to play either one. 
I, I just probably won't be able to play either one. But we should have a Here I Stand game going and a Virgin Queen game going at Historic Fest this year. Mm. Yeah, so one game that you have talked about that's on my radar now is John Company, which we're going to oh, play. Yeah. And yes. I'm wondering if John Company is going to be a lighter alternative to Here I Stand. Um, it's got the negotiation. It doesn't have combat in it, not player-to-player -player combat, but the negotiation stuff and... Sometimes you have to be sort of semi co-op and I'm really curious to see how that plays. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. All of those things are present, the negotiation, the wheeling and dealing. Mm -hmm. And it, it is almost like every time you advance to a next part of the, the round, you kind of reevaluate and make new deals and just look at, it's like a new snapshot to kind of evaluate the board state. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if simpler is the right word. Um, it's a different Shorter. experience. It, well, it can be. I guess it depends on how many, how long a game you play. There's different scenarios or whatever. Right. And you can add in different, like, I'm sure we'll just play the basic scenario when, when we play in February, but you can add in, like, different offshoot companies that kind of compete with the East India, India Trade Company. Um, it's just different. And it's not so, it's not asynchronous. Okay. Right. You're all, yeah. rep you're all playing a family and you may be given a different governorship or a different role in the company. So you're doing something different, but that may change the drop of a hat you may be kicked out of that spot or next round you you have no positions or, or something like that yeah i mean it's i don't know if i'd really compare them so much okay. just in the sense that they're both very political wheeling and dealing games which is a good point to bring up i think we need to reevaluate our list of top six political games there we go after after you yeah, play john play. company and dune yeah. have you played dune yet i have not yeah okay so i'm yeah. looking forward to comparing here i stand to twilight imperium and john company yeah, and then throw Dune in the list. I, I really think you need to try yeah, to play I Dune need to play too. That one. We should set that up for Historic Fest. Dune. Oh yeah, and that's a you can play that in an evening. Yeah, like that can be a nighttime game. Cool. Sweet. All right, we have a game, folks. We playing Trivia Pursuit again? Uh, no, I have a. Well, we can do. It's you know, <laughs> player's choice. You want you want Trivial Pursuit or you want the war well, game? What game? did the uh, what did the what did the fans want? What did they say on Discord? Oh, I think everyone wants the war game game. Okay. I think you and I are the only ones that enjoy Trivial Pursuit. But uh, Paul probably liked it. Paul, so yeah, Paul and, but remember, Paul is in. Paul and Rex are on the, uh, the poop list until they actually play their <laughs> wilderness true. war game. Yeah, when they finish their game, then they get a say. All right. Yeah. War game, game, game. War game, game. We have a game. It's the game of games. It's the game of war games. Uh, I give Rich clues up to ten of them, and he tries to guess a game, and uh, we start at ten points. He gets a free guess. Every clue I give him reduces a point. Mitch gets it before everyone else somehow, and that's how it works. Yeah. And you can play at home and let us know your top score. Alright. So oh I get my. my I get my one free, and I get ten there points if I get this, and I get... I think you have to mail you have to mail me a gold rip, gold medal ribbon, too. Uh, oh, I, okay. If you... I, I promise. <laughs> if you ever get it on the first guess. Alright. Well, the game is Flying Colors. No. Oh, man. All right, let's play. I guess play. I'll take a clue. This game was released in 2014. <sighs> That's like right before I got back into wargaming. Um, I wasn't even born yet. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> Heights of Courage. No. I don't know when that was released, but it sounds That was a good right. guess. Yeah. A little different. Uh, this is part of a, a fairly big series. Yeah. It's Heights of Courage, then. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> What's uh, the other one that's related to Heights of Courage? Oh, um, Yom Kippur. Like, there's two, there's two Jerusalem games. What would you say? Yom Kippur, I think. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yom Kippur. <laughs> it's not Yom Kippur. 2014, part of a big series. Is there an OCS game that came around and then? Let me think. I'm looking at my shelf, because that's not cheating. Reluctant Enemies. No. Okay. Good guess. Uh, this is a multi. Uh, this is a design for multiplayer game. Design for multiplayer. 2014 part of a series. Multiplayer series. Now that's interesting. That kind of throws me off. Virgin Queen. Nice. No. Not really a series, but sort of. Okay. Uh, let's see. That's three. Yeah. Uh, this was published by GMT Games. Okay. Oh, I wonder if it's a coin game. 2014. Andy and Abyss. Good guess. No. All right. According to BGG, this is the 13th best war game of all time. Hmm. Fire in the Lake? Nice. You got it. That's it. All right. I yeah, I really yeah, had to stretch clues. When I got to clues. coin, I, had to, I knew 
that'd be the best one. Nice. I wanted to skirt around coin for a long time because <laughs> I think as soon as you knew it was coin, yeah. I'm surprised you went Andy and Abyss first. Yeah, and I, I should have maybe picked a more coin started. One. Andy and Abyss was actually the first one, right? Yeah. And Fire in the Lake is what volume in the series? Uh, that is four, I believe. Oh, okay. All right. So there we go. Hey, I'll take a five. Yeah, it's not bad. I didn't make you have to rhyme it, so it's a success. Yeah, Indian Abyss was first, right? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was, yeah. What am I think? What's the three-player one? Is that Colonial Twilight? Colonial and Twilight. And I know that wasn't first. Yeah, that okay, one yeah, came yeah. out well, fairly yeah. recently, like right before COVID maybe. seventeen. Yeah, yeah. I just didn't want to mix up Indian Abyss and Fire in the Lake. Oh, so. yeah, yeah. Uh, and the reason I picked this is in February, yeah. in a few weeks, we'll be playing A Distant Plane. That's Which right. I'm very excited for because I really like Fire in the Lake, and I've heard that a distant plane is one of the best. Excellent, because I have not played that one. I was neither have I. I've uh, I've played most of them. I don't think I've I haven't played Andy and Abyss, and I haven't played the newest ones, but most of them I played. But I have not played Distant Plane, so that'll fill in that gap. Yeah, It'll be a good time. All right, speaking of a good time, we're about to have a good time. Yeah, we're doing something a little bit different. We have five games this is very different this was like stressful for me (laughs) (laughs) i well i'm sorry it it was stressful for you we the patrons voted and this month was small game extravaganza so i kind of picked i sorry rich you didn't get much input on this (laughs) but these are all five games i've more or less enjoyed most of them uh over the last year that are, I would say, are small filler games, mm-hmm. um, which are rare in the war game historical sphere. And so what I have proposed and what we are going to do is I have set a five-minute timer. We are going to talk about the game, talk about the topic, the recommended reading, and our general thoughts on each game. Five minutes, then we'll move to the next one, and we'll do that. So we have 25 minutes to up to 25 minutes to discuss all five of these games attack sub rank them all at the end or rank them in their five minutes rank them all at the end okay gotcha so talk about them general thoughts get to the rankings broad thoughts on on these games and kind of how they filter into the list that type of thing and then we're going to rank them all right all right real quick i don't think i listed them attack sub Mm -hmm. flashpoint south china sea yep 300 earth and water Mm -hmm. the shores of tripoli yeah red flag over pairs yeah, so pretty interesting because these are pretty new games, uh, except for Attack Sub. They're all in the last, what, four years? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So. Yep. All right. Are you so, ready? Well, are you ready? Because I'm going to go ahead and say I have not played Attack Sub. So that one you're on your own for. I will contribute when we start with Flashpoint South China Sea. Okay, here we go. I'm starting the timer on, and I, I have an actual timer here. All right. Um, and I'm eating into the time. So, Attack Sub. I just talked about this is designed by Courtney F. Allen and published in 1991. This is a, and intended to be designed, a very fast playing, very light, for a casual gamer, modern um, Attack Sub game, uh, submarine game. And it's very much in the upfront game. You have ship cards that are kind of your personality cards and it's very abstracted there is no battlefield you move around you don't move your ships you kind of close and expand range amongst each other and just like any good naval game you have to detect each other every action you take i shouldn't say every action most of the actions you can take give an option for the player to detect you kind of react to it and what how the upfront system works for lack of a better term is you do a random number check and the way you do that is you flip a card off the top of the deck and you're trying to you're trying to find a result cards can add or subtract to the results and you're trying to take out a certain number of ships and you can do that by taking out like core systems of the ship um or you can just sink them right uh it's pretty cool and just it's got a great lineup of ships so you're not just in a su- it's not sub on sub you can actually get like a whole surface fleet presence and you have a bunch of different ships represented. You can actually launch helicopters and use them for, for different things. It's very light. There's not a lot of room for in-depth uh, decision-making. It was, it was nice to play this. I, 
<laughs> bless my wife's heart. Like she likes some of these shorter games, but I did have her play a tax sub with me, mm-hmm. uh, or or try rather. Uh, that that was pretty much a non-starter. But after playing a tax sub and then getting the chance to compare up front to it, uh, up up front is clearly the better game. So you, but you mentioned Tank Duel earlier in comparison. Have you played Tank Duel? I haven't yet. But okay, the, these because, both make me really want yeah, to play Tank Duel. Yeah, it sounds I have played Tank Duel, and everything yeah. you're saying about a tag sub sounds like it's Tank Duel underwater. <laughs> tank Tank Duel is is a follow up to Upfront. I I'm almost certain that's like how it's been pitched, okay. right? Yeah. Uh, this also reminds me of the Dan Versen games, Modern Tank oh, and sure. Modern yeah. Naval Battles, All but these his, are his better games. Not the leader games, Not no. Those. They're okay. called Modern Naval battles or something like that okay very much in the same vein you're flipping cards off the deck you have this fleet um i like this a lot more it's it's very light rich it's it's plop the top card you have a limited um amount of hands or amount of cards in your hand if you want new cards you have to kind of forego actions to discard and draw back up it it doesn't solo well although rex mentioned today a solo rule for up front where you just you play solo with two hands, but you don't look at the new hand until it's that okay. player's turn, sure. which is brilliant. I wish I would have thought of that because I could have then spent some more recent time with Attack Sub. All of these games are going to get this caveat. Attack Sub is not very deep. My first experience with Attack Sub was a follow-up game while I was killing time to play something out at a convention. And we played two games back-to-back. And you can do a little short scenario where you got two ships going at each other, or you can do like this big long one and, and kind of stretch things out. I I have heard that you can do multiplayer up front by kind of combining decks. I think you could kind of manipulate attack sub to do uh multiplayer, but um it's it's not in the rules I've experienced. It's not in there, which is the same cuz it'd be really cool to carve your ships up. Um recommended reading. What's that Tom Clancy book that you always recommend that uh The Hunt for Red October? Well, okay, that's a good one. Or, What's the other or one? Or the big Red one Alert? would be, uh, oh gosh, what was the name? Um, Red, Alert? Red Storm Rising. Red Storm Rising. Yeah. Yeah. So there's your recommended reading because this is a Cold War Gone Hot. It's a modern naval game. It's fun. It's light. It's very light. It probably is the second least decision space out of these five games. And I'm going to stop. All right. We five minutes. 40... Attack set. Any, Perfect. Anything you want to add or any questions you have about it? No, only that... Um... Yeah, you should play Tank Duel because it, everything you say about this game sounds like it's Tank Duel. And I played Tank Duel a few times. It wasn't my cup of tea. I ended up selling it. But, I mean, I would play it again. It was interesting enough to play. I just didn't think I was going to get much use out of it. Yeah, playing up front has me really excited to try multiplayer Tank Duel. Yeah. So, cool. All right, Flashpoint South China Sea. Um, I'm resetting the timer. <laughs> I'll start with this one. This is a newer game. Um, This is by Harold Buchanan. Uh, This one just came out. Let's see, what year did this come out? 2022. 2022, So brand new game. And this is in that GMT, I think they call it like the lunchtime battle series or something like that. Games specifically designed to be played in something like 30 minutes. Yeah. Uh, It covers South China Sea in the modern era. I think what I've talked about in the four is, I'm just going to throw this out there. The theme we talked about it what i say it was like selling sardines or something like that could be this uh it's a card driven game yep and it's a very limited menu of actions you also have events uh and you're manipulating cubes around a map trying to either um you can place your cubes either as diplomatic or what's the other one uh i can't remember there's 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 economic and then you can place it on like the contested islands and well, like and then economics like Duwok and China readmission or something like that. Right. So there's there's the those islands and then economic and diplomatic yeah. tracks that you can place your cubes. Yeah. Um, some of those are more permanent than others, and it's just really this uh, pool of cubes to inf- to strengthen your influence in the South China Sea. So this one, and tell me if I'm crazy for thinking this. This one gave me a real Twilight Struggle vibe. Yeah, toilet um, struggle in twenty minutes. Yeah, because you're 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 placing cl- cubes to try to get influence. It didn't have the like pay more if the other guy has it, but um, you've got a uh, well the victory point track that's done in a lot of games where you can go either way. But you know if you take certain actions, it like raises the escalation and it mm-hmm. changes how much things cost and things like that. So I got a twilight struggle vibe from this one. 
Yeah, but what I do like about it, and this is a game I did not anticipate liking at all. And the more I li- play, the more I like it. Um, I'm not a huge Twilight Struggle fan, but this does its thing and it gets out of the way. Yeah. And it's not well, the scoring it's, also reminded me of Twilight Struggle. The way the score. Yeah, you kind of score. Yeah. One area. Mm-hmm. Um, and but you what? And it's not scored. It is scored at the end of the game. But like in Twilight Struggle, you're in control of when that area is scored. Right. Which is great. Yeah. Um, and everyone can see that they're available, and either player can do it. It's not like the scorecard is tied to your hand, although you do have to like match a symbol. Yeah. Um, I don't have any recommended reading for this because no, I haven't I read can't. anything about. Yeah, I mean, and, I guess and the it's news a, it's sort of a theoretical <laughs> modern game. So yeah, go read Reuters. Yeah, I go, don't know. Go get Next War Taiwan and we'll see whatever the recommended reading for that one is. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Yeah. Uh, y- yeah, I mean it's got some really cool things like China's, you know, placement of forces in in the islands is permanent, um, but it gets more expensive. Mm-hmm. The U.S. or the like free world is what well, I don't even know what they're called. I've I've the, only played the that blue. side once. <laughs> the blue, yeah. um, again, theme is weak here. Um, they have a fixed fee, but they are not permanent placements. And I there's like a you can kind of like build up a, a big move um, where basically you replace your opponent's cubes there. And like that, I didn't put a lot of expectation in that particular action until it got done to me. I was like, Oh, this is really important. And that was kind of my like first go at this game is, Oh, this is like the path to victory. You just do this and you win. That's not the case. You, there's lots of different ways to make sure you get the victory points. Um, both sides do play similarly, but they play different enough. And again, I think the big selling point here is it's this contesting for influence and control like in Twilight Struggle, but there's nothing that gets in the way and you play it in 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Yeah. Once you know it. Yeah. Yeah. I thought the uh, available versus reserve thing was kind of interesting yeah. too. If you want to be able to place more cubes on the board, it takes basically it takes an action to to get them ready so you don't just have everything available and it was interesting yeah outside of 300 and attack sub this is going to be a since we have some time here this is going to be a critique of all three of these games because i think the shores of triple e box is pretty big too this could be in a box the size of battle line yeah and i haven't seen this one physical so i don't know yeah it's just like make it smaller. Yeah. And this was a point that um, just because I was talking to Rex about these games today, um, if these are going to serve as your filler game in your backpack when you're going to a game day, you're going to a con, they should fit in a backpack as a filler game, meaning they should be the size of a tax sub. They should be yeah. the size of a victory point games box. Yeah. There's no, this doesn't, this and Shores of Tripoli and Red Flag over Paris don't need the box sizes they do. You could shrink down the map. I understand why you want it to be flashy and catch people's eyes. You don't need that here. Yeah. And out of all of these games, I think Shores of Tripoli, I, I actually own a copy of that. That's probably the only one oh. that I've seen what the physical box looks like. So. All right. That's five minutes. That's our timer. All right. All right. Here we go. 300 Earth and Water. Oh, I love this game. 300 Sparta. Earth and Water. 2018 Yasushi Nakaguru. This is Sparta and Persia. Yeah. So first thing I want to say about this one, it's on Rally the Troops. So if you want to play it, perfect place to go try it out. Absolutely. And that's where Patrick and I played a bunch of games of it. Oh my gosh. It's so fun. Combat is ridiculous. Like it's so <laughs> frustrating as the Persians because most of your attacks as the Persians are going to miss. Yeah. It's like bad risk. Okay. And as the Persians in this game, just to sort of clarify the whole thing, it's entirely on you to go into Greece and take land. Like yeah. it's your job to, to, to go to Greece. <laughs> And you swarm the, the like the Spartans only have like eight cubes yeah. that they could have on the whole map. Your responsibility is to swarm them and outnumber them because they're going to kick your ass in battle. I did get desperate against Tom in a game, and I uh, um I attacked Sparta with one guy on a boat, and I won. And I was like, <laughs> well, I did not expect that to happen. It's it's this really interesting game. Okay, so combat super simple. You have supply lines that can easily get disrupted because you have naval landings and all this stuff. The beauty of this game is the allocate the uh, the economy. Yes, that's the coolest thing about this game. 
Oh, yeah. You have, for example, as the Persians, you have 12 actions to open those rounds. Those 12 yeah, actions 12 can bucks. be... You, <laughs> 12 bucks 12 to spend. bucks, yeah. <laughs> they can buy cards, they can buy units, and they can buy a boat, or you can play with an alternate where you get more boats. But... Right, and you have you pretty much have to buy a bridge your first turn, which costs yep. six bucks. But it lasts buy a the bridge. whole game, so... Well, no, it gets blown up. <laughs> it oh, can well, get blown maybe up there's a card for it that I never saw, but okay. <laughs> Well, no, I think if like if the Greeks go in the official, uh, oh, uh, the well, I never saw the, the Greeks do there. that. The Greeks always oh, pretty much yeah. just. Now, I wouldn't say they turtled, but they defended Greece. They never in the games I played, they never made it all the way to Sparta. And the the cards can either be moved just for movement, or they can be used for the event, or they can be used for activation. So, like the for example, the Persian player, you're really balanced, or like balancing. I want a massive horde of guys to run over the Spartans. But I also need the cards to do the activations I want because you move like one space at a time. Mm -hmm. And so you need a card to be able to move as far as you want to go. But then you're giving up troops. And then the Spartans, like you don't you can't spend as much money and your forces kick ass. You just don't have that many guys available. And so you're kind of like picking your attack. You can like sell and take islands and stuff. I love the economy in this game. It's it really makes the game shine. Yeah. That's the coolest part about it. Um. I also thought, so, um, be, and this just comes from the economy, but, I mean, not having as many cards because you wanted to save more for troops has real effects because a lot of the cards, often the event is better than moving troops. It can do so, some devastating yeah. things. Oh, but the other really cool thing, if you play Sparta and you try to buy too many cards, there are some bomb cards in there that will like end instantly end your turn. <laughs> yeah, same thing with, with the Persians. I actually had them back to back in my last game. I think I, I said Spartans, but yeah, the Persians have those cards. Yeah. yeah. So like, yeah, your king dies and you just lost your entire turn. And if you had bought five cards that turned instead of six, maybe it wouldn't have come up. <laughs> yeah. So the game can like, you can play, it's a five round game or whatever. Yeah. Um, like you can lose two of those rounds to cards. Yeah, yeah. It, and it, it it's a nice variance. It's like almost like a push your luck as well as having limited resources. Right. Reading, just go watch the movie Three Hundred. I mean, this <laughs> is like beer and pretzel, right? Like sure. you should watch Three Hundred, even though it's not historically accurate. Whatever you want to say, what? I don't care. This game is just stupid fun, and you should watch something that's stupid fun to go with it. So watch Three Hundred and play this. There you go. Do not have high expectations for combat resolution in battle. <laughs> I'm sorry, but especially uh, unless you're playing the Spartans the first time, then you're going to love combat because you're like, I held off Patrick like six on one, and one guy was just like, yeah. yeah. Well, also, there's a maximum number of dice you can throw. I mean, you bring in like right. 12 guys, you're still only going to throw three go, dice. Three dice, yeah. Three, so. yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's it's a it's a lot of fun, and it's so cool that it's on 300. Fred Serval recommended this to me. Uh, I love that I have a copy. It's never leaving my collection. Nice. All right. Resetting who pro- the time. Who, uh, who produces that one? Uh, It's Nuts, I think. Oh, okay. All right. Cool. All okay. Right. I'm going to reset the Next timer. Um, I'll look up who produced that other one, and you can start on Shores of Tripoli. Yeah, Shores of Tripoli, another fairly new game. This one came out in 2020. Uh, designer is Kevin Bertram, and I'm looking at the box, trying to remember who produces that one uh flying circle i think does that sound right yeah yeah, yeah. he's kevin bertram's the one yeah he's the head honcho behind that as yeah. well yeah so uh fort circle fort Shores circle. Tripoli, fort circle that's it um um it's you're playing the americans uh in the mediterranean versus the the tripolitans which is just like an alliance of north african nations um and it's so oh, what is how long is this one six eight rounds this is this might be the longest of all of these games but it's still not long. I mean, you can play in less than an hour easily. So it's another card-driven game. Um, basically, with the Americans, you're you're moving frigates around. You're trying to stop piracy. So so the North Africans, the Tripolitans, they are if they get they accumulate twelve gold coins, they win. Um, if the Americans can invade Tripoli at the end of, or successfully invade Tripoli at the end of the game, they win. There are a few other victory conditions, but. Um, Basically, you're just, you know, combat, again, is pretty simple. I think you need sixes. Um, yeah. Yeah, but the, the big thing is the American ships can take two hits. Most of the Tripolitan ships can only take one hit. Um, they do get some later that can take two hits. But um, it's it's another pretty simple game. There is an American army that shows up at one point in the game, and it's basically going to take three different turns or at least three different actions to move from space to space to get to Tripoli. So if the Tripolitans, they're going to see that army coming a mile away and know it's coming. 
Um, but even though this game has more turns, the turns themselves are very limited. So you get you get four seasons, and then the turn is over. And um, it it really you're you're stretched. It, it goes a lot faster than you want it to. You're like, I really want to be able to do one more thing, but the turn's over and we're done. So, um, the sorry, go ahead. Well, I just a card play is one season, and then with the yeah. card, you can either play the event, you can move frigates, or you can build gunboats, yep. or if you're the tri- Tripolitans, you can raid yep. or, or build, move ships. Yeah, build another ship. Um, I will say the main criticism I have with this one is the same one that I had with 300. Um, and all the five games on this list, these were the two that this really stuck out at me. Um, two or three turns, two or three games in, you you feel like you've seen every card and the game starts to feel pretty samey. So for these two in particular, I felt that way. I didn't feel that way for Red Flag Over Paris or South China Sea as much. Um, but for these two in particular, after like three games, I'm like, yeah, I think I've seen that game. And the cards, they're going to come out of different orders, but it's gonna every game's going to kind of look the same. Yeah, here's... Um, I like what Fort Circle Games is doing. The first half of this game is irrelevant. You're playing whack-a-mole. Just don't yeah. let the Tripolitan raid too much. It's, And then it's going to come down to the same like sequence of events. Mm-hmm. And especially because cards are reserved. And then right. it's got this process where like... So like your key cards are tucked away. So you're going to see them. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of when these key cards are played. Yeah. So they're not really part of the deck. And so obviously as the Tripolitans, you're going to build your frigate when it makes sense to block the Americans from taking Tripoli. Yep. Yeah, and as the Americans, you know that as soon as you, you know, put an army in this space, they're going to get two more frigates and this event is going to happen. There's a lot of cards that are, it gives you a choice, but you're always going to play that event when the thing happens. Yeah, most of the time. And here's the other thing, like, later on, you just draw so many, like, you go through the deck twice, Mm -hmm. so you see all the events, you can get, like, it's dependent on certain cards, but then you're just discarding and working through the deck. And so it gets to the point where you're drawing a ton of cards, but then you have to discard all of them to, to see them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's very light. It's, it's beer and pretzels, a great topic. Like there's just not that many Tripoli games and people really, really like this game. Yeah, I mean the it's game pre- that want the book that one of us loved so much last year, six <laughs> frigates. Yeah. Um, is, I mean, it talks a lot about this exact war. So, that's my recommended reading would be Six Frigates. Six Froggets. Six Froggets. <laughs> um, yeah. I don't know. It, it's not It's not for me. Yeah. I mean, it's it's okay. It, it is what it is. Like I said, it's, it's samey. But this is a game that I could see playing with my daughter. You know, it's, it's yeah. not going to take long to play. I could even see me taking this to Starbucks or something like that because it, it doesn't take up a lot of space. The board is maybe, I don't know, two feet long and eight inches high and each have a deck of cards and that's it. So, I mean, not even each have a deck, but you share a deck. So yeah. All right. We're out of time. All right. Here it goes. There's the last one. All right. All right. This is, this is my jam. Um, (laughs) I love red flag over Paris. This is a game covering the Paris commune. Um, It is based off the Fort Sumter system. It blows Fort Sumter out of a cannon. Um, this is a game, it's a card-driven game. You can either play a card for, you can either discard a card to kind of up your momentum, for lack of a better word. Um, you can play it for the ops to place or remove cubes, or you can use it for the event. As you're playing these cards, and this also happens in Flashpoint South China Sea, as you discard it, if it's the opponent's event, they can kind of seal that card back so it's not lost forever. That's a cool thing, yeah. I did solo play with the the new variant, and I do recommend it. You get to see more cards and kind of discard card discard cards. You don't <laughs> need the new cards to play it. Um, it does just let you see more of the cards and kind of build your hand a little bit better. What's really interesting about this game is you're reserving cards for the final round. Whether that final round happens after round one or round two, I find it hard to believe it could happen in round one, but you can kind of push the game into the end, end game um, with if everyone like pulls their cubes out really fast. Um, So you're building your ultimate turn hand for the future. Um, You'll be able to discard one of those cards so you could like block a key event, those types of things. But you're trying to take control of both political as well as military spaces, and you're just vying back and forth. Yeah. Um, It plays super well two-handed solo. I've I've never even messed with the bot because I like it two-handed. And look, 
I'll, I'll get to the point where I rank them. Like, if I'm grabbing a game for a con or a filler game or something like that, this is the first one going in. Okay. Um, so, yeah, I played Fort Sumter, and I thought it was one of the most boring games I've ever played in my life. So, yeah. all the time you've been talking about this, I'm like, yeah, yeah, whatever. And it is definitely a lot better than Fort Sumter. Um, you've already covered the you know the basics of the game but for anyone else like me that has played fort sumter and wants to know what's different i will tell you the main things that are different um so this one does have what are they called forts and barricades i think yep um, which make it harder to move into certain spaces so that's a that's a nice little addition um but the main thing is the the sort of scoring track so so one side wants to win over public opinion and the other side wants to win military. So each side is trying to do something different, but you can do the other guy's thing to sort of reduce his score in that area. So at the end of the game, if if I have three points in public opinion and Matt has two points in military, I have won the game. But if he can knock me down to two in public opinion, then, you know, I can't remember what the tiebreaker is. But, but the point is... They're, they're separate scoring tracks, but you can affect the other person's track. And, and that, I think, is really interesting. That's probably the single biggest improvement over Fort Sumter. The end game is also different. You have more control of what happens in the final yeah. crisis, which is this in, ultimate... Even in like, Fort Sumter, there's a similar thing, though, where you have cards that are going to come up later. This like, is better, though. I yeah. don't remember exactly how it happens, but it felt more random and you had less control. Yeah. Um. What? So uh, we played today. Uh, Rex and I did. Yeah. And he was the um, the government who wants military points. They o- they only win automatically if they have more v- military points than the commune has, has political points. Po- yeah, public. Yeah, political. Yeah, that's what they're P- public opinion. Yeah, yeah. Same. Yeah. We didn't get that. He had no military points. <laughs> I had all the military points. He had all the political <laughs> points. I think I had four, and he and, had and five. And that's the other like, cool thing is that so if you're playing the commies and you have four military points. Um, and whatever Rex has two public opinion points, you both have zero because then you go to the tiebreakers, right? For tiebreakers. Yeah. Then it goes to tiebreakers, but the game doesn't care if you have the wrong kind of points. (laughs) Right. And so we both blocked each other and like he, I've never been so spanked in the public opinion sphere. Like he got me, (laughs) you have, you always have presence on the map. You're never completely shut out, but he might as well have like every time I popped up, he's like, yeah, those guys are gone. Those guys are gone. Those (laughs) guys are gone. And so like, I never had a chance there. And so it came down to uh, tiebreakers, which is also interesting is based off majority. So it's not who has the most points. It's who has the most points, who completed the most objectives, who compo- oh yeah, I forgot uh, about the objectives. I think who those holds, are both games, but yeah. oh, the uh, the objectives are awesome. Yeah, who holds the most key spaces and who? There's one more, dang. There's one more tiebreaker, and it's majority of those. So yeah. it's not like priority. Uh, so if you have three of the four tiebreakers, you're gonna win. Yeah, even if you don't have the most points. I love it. Uh, recommended reading because we're running out of time is Revolutions Podcast by Mike Duncan. Yeah, which is excellent. Yeah. Not reading, but uh, you Listening get the point. Here. Yep. Yeah, I Ooh. listened to that last year, even before I played the game, just because you were talking about it, and it sounded interesting. And if you want more information, check out our interview with Fred's Falls. A ton of fun. Yeah. All right. Awesome. We did it. We made it. All five games. Yeah. Now we got to rank them. Spend like 10 we minutes rank ranking them. each one. No, 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 no. <laughs> I think this will go fast. And I, uh, Bill brought up a good point on the Discord. And I want to share that. And I want to share Courtney F. Allen's comments from a tax sub i'll start with bill so bill said do, 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 do. how much is there game enough is there is yeah is there enough game there i'm struggling with sure is tripoli red flag over paris and flashpoint south china sea being more than aggressively okay fun to have a beer trash talk and move a few pieces around but i'm not finding much depth Red Flag Over Paris is probably the best of those three for me, but that may be more because I'm learning a lot. I wonder how much of the popularity of them is three genuinely nice guys as designers. Real quick, here's what Courtney F. Allen said about designing uh, a tax sub. Action cards allow one to incorporate all random results tables and player interaction in an easily used and understood manner. As a side benefit, they also allow almost any probability distribution. That's not the important part. But most importantly, cards allow for fast play. This is a must for the less must for the less serious game player who is a primary audience for which this game is intended. So I wanted to take Bill's concern and Courtney F. Allen's approach 
which is what is the point of these games? And that's kind of the broad comment I wanted to make is I talk about how much I enjoy Red Flag over Paris. But realistically, this isn't going to hold much weight to U.S. Civil War. Shores of Tripoli, I, I kind of was hard on it. But if I have 10 minutes at a con and someone says, hey, do you want to check this game out about like U.S. Marines against pirates in Tripoli? And I'll be like, what? Hell yes, I want to check it out. Um, and you're going to spend 10 or 15 minutes with it, especially if who you're playing with really knows the games. Maybe you're going to spend 30 minutes. doesn't matter. And so the role of these games, they are beer and pretzel fun, but we have a very heavy list and we play a lot of heavy games and it's been really refreshing over the last year to break away from that and to have quality games that aren't just, I don't know. We talk about comparing them to Twilight Struggle, but they they feel better than Twilight Struggle Light to me because I feel like there are a lot of Twilight Struggle Light games out there. Yeah. And these don't get in the way of them. Whether I, you know, I don't like some of the things in, in Shores of Tripoli, I'm not going to turn a game down because it's just so fun to be like, and like, gosh, if I was playing live and we were shit talking and, and drinking a beer, yeah, that's that's awesome. So I think that is just my takeaway or at least my process of going into this and i agree the designers behind these are like some of the best people like in the war game sphere uh if you haven't read kevin bartram's blog about publishing and designing and the process and profitability behind i, I said bartram kevin bertram's uh blog go check it out it's really insightful he's putting together a, a con that we could never match in kansas city uh, it's just really cool. And Fred Serval's podcast is one of my favorite things to listen to. Um, it it rocks. And so these are great people. And so it probably does get some points. But also, like, just level out your expectations. When I talk about how much I love Red Flag Over Paris, the the perspective matters, right? Yeah, it's it's not competing with other games. I will say, though, like, just as an overall thing, and I like I said, I noticed mostly on... Shores of Tripoli and 300. Um, I think I think there's going to be a maximum amount of time that I'm going to play probably any of these games. And, you know, it might be more times played, but it's going to be like fewer number of hours than I'm, yeah. than I'm used to getting out of a game. Like, I, I mean, I take a game, I'm not even going to go with something like Pacific War, but something like Thunder in the Ozarks. Over the course of my life, I can easily see myself playing that game for a hundred hours. You know, if I play it, you know, sure. 50 times or 25 times or whatever, these games over the course of my life, it's going to be like two or three hours. Yeah. There will be a few of these that have more staying power. Again, red flag over power Paris. Absolutely. I get what you're saying about 300, but just with the variance of what can happen with the cards and who ends up with them. Yeah. And like, you can just drop into Athens. You don't have to use the bridge if you don't want to. I'm not saying you should. I think there's enough variance yeah, there in the buy, game. Buy enough boats. These have shelf viability for me just for, look, outside of this month, I probably, like, Cat's not going to play these games with me. I, like, other than this, right? And I think she liked 300 the most when we played it. I'm not pulling this off the shelf a ton. Yeah. It's for me, these are con games. And so you're right, Rich. I agree. Yeah, maybe. Other than Red Flag Repairs, <clears throat> again. Cause, just because I really like that game, okay? but We can tell. <laughs> all the others, they're just a con game. And they're going to be there when I need to kill 15, 20, 30 minutes. And this ranking and where they go on the list is kind of like, okay, what games am I filling my convention game day bag with? Mm -hmm. And which games are worth like filling up space? Yeah. Like you said, though, would it be better if they were on a box half the size? Oh, yeah, because, correct me if I'm wrong, like, Shores of Tripoli is like a normal yeah, game box, it's a right? regular size box, yeah. Yeah, so just Tripoli, and with, I mean, that's fine, like, whatever. I don't know why that size was picked, but, like, just take the Victory Point games, we were talking about this, do the jigsaw thing, like, where you can put the map together and mm -hmm. play the game and put it in a small box. But most of these don't need the map. Yeah, because there's do. not that many components in it either. They're not taking up a lot of space. Yeah, even South China Sea can be shrunk down. Red Flag over Paris can yeah. be shrunk down. Like, you need the map for the spatial. I do appreciate that. Um, but just, I don't know. Trim it down. Make yeah, it I the mean, battle ultimately, line. Ultimately, Flashpoint, South China Sea, 
doesn't even need a map. You could use a card for each of those spaces. Yeah, sure. Yeah, why not, right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean that's really nitpicky stuff. Here's here's the big takeaway too is these are just fun. Don't don't expect you know, some of these did get really like praised up, but yeah. like don't outside of a small games category. Yeah. None I of mean, these are going to win like Yeah, and I will say so, yes, varying levels, um but there's not a single game on this list that if someone brought it to me and we had a half hour, I would say no, I'm not playing that game. Agreed. A hundred percent. That's good. And I have a, I have an internal ranking of what I like think of the the five of them too. And it's it, I mean it's gonna play out on the list. So let's rank them. All right. How do you want to do it? Do you wanna just do them one at a time or you wanna pick yeah, out your I favorite they... and start there? Because I think you probably like Red Flag over Paris the best. Yeah, so let's start that. And All that right. can kind of set the That'll, ceiling. Yeah, sure. And we have some games on the list where I think this can. So what's what's funny is I've been thinking that I think Red Flag over Paris is better than Battle Him, but it's not <laughs> better than things like Onward Christian Soldiers, Blitzkrieg Legend, Axis Empire, Seki Gahara. Yeah. You know, I have to drop a bit. I just think Battle Him is, is yeah. punching above its weight. Yeah, I hope I'm not repeating myself because I can't remember where I said it, but I think I said it on the podcast that the further I get away from Battle Him, the less I like it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yep, yeah, that was here. Uh, I like this more than 1754. Okay. And more than NATO and more than Pavlov's house. Okay. And Brave Little Belgium. So I would put this... I mean, I do like it more than Labyrinth, but Labyrinth is a much better game design. And I would say Washington's Crossing is a better game design as well. Yeah, I think so too. Yeah. I think it goes above 1754, but it does crack the top 40 right. for now. You good with that? Yeah, I'm good with that. All right, red flag over Paris I mean, coming in number four. I'm not going to argue with you personally. I'd probably take NATO Air Commander over this one, but I'm not going to argue it. They're actually really close for yeah. me. I think they're actually closer than uh, when we kind of talked about this. There's not enough to move 1754 down, right? But I do like NATO more than than 1754. All right. So uh, the all right. What was your What was your favorite on the one? list? Um, I would say the next best game on the list is probably Flashpoint South China Sea. Okay, yeah, I can go with that. That's what I um, go next. Okay, so then I kind of thought, I'm thinking in the same area. You know, the game that internally, when, as I was playing these, I was already like thinking of is where does this rank up against Brave Little Belgium? Hmm. Yeah. So Brave Little Belgium sitting there at 46, and Twilight Struggle is a couple spots down at 48. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think? Somebody's somebody's gonna be very upset at that, but we don't care. Well, yeah. We're um, gosh, we didn't even talk about it, folks. We have a list. We have a list of every war game ranked from list. worst to best to worst, with U.S. Civil War at the top, and uh, we have this whole spiel we give. But here's the deal: Rec, uh, Rich and I are merely the shapers. We we mold the clay. We close each other's eyes, we stick our hands out, and whatever shape this clay takes, we just follow it. So if you're mad about Twilight Struggle at 48, well, folks, it's objective, 100%. The U.S. Civil War is the best game ever made, and just deal with it. Okay, so yeah, we have a list, and that's what we're ranking these yeah. games on, is this list. Flashpoint South China Sea versus Brave Little Belgium. Well, I think we hit the right spot, because that's actually a tough call. And then you well you have Konigsberg above it, which is a game you did not necessarily like as a two-player game. I was disappointed game. in it, but I think it's a well-designed game if you play it solitaire. <laughs> okay, so is this better or worse than that? Um, I, I think Konigsberg is probably a better game. Okay, Brave Little Belgium, which is also beer and pretzels, also, more yeah. in the sense of a typical war game. I think Don't... I give the edge to South China Sea actually. Okay, I'm fine with that. Yeah. All right, Flashpoint South, below Konigsberg, above Brave Little Belgium, coming in at 46. Yeah. Um, let's do what I think is the next best uh, in 300. Okay. Um, I like 300. <laughs> this is going to make people mad. I like people. I like 300 more than Arden 2024. It's a question whether I like it more than Brave Little Belgium or not. So that's better than Twilight Struggle and yeah. better than Angola. Oh, my gosh. Angola is picking up steam again. And, like, yeah, it's got some great mechanics. And the turner stuff is brilliant. But the it's, combat it's resolution, resolution is of just stacks running. I mean, it's, it's like so tight. unsatisfying. Yeah. Um, 
you did not play Arden 2024, right? I did not, no. Okay. Uh, so, what? Uh, again, Brave Little Belgium then is the measuring stick. Brave Little Belgium versus, and remind me where we are again, uh, versus 300. 300. Yeah. I like Brave, so both I like Brave Little Belgium better. Okay. I'm, yeah, you don't have to pull my league. Yeah. But I think it's right there. It's yep. and it's. it's I figured these would all cluster kind of like this. Yeah, I'm gonna put it above our Den 2024 and above uh, Twilight Struggle. All right. I'm so like I said, I haven't played Attack Sub. Okay. Um, so I say let's go ahead and do Shores of Tripoli, and then you yeah. can do Attack Sub. Yeah. Okay. So where do you think for Shores of Tripoli? Shores of Tripoli. Because I think you liked it more than me although i, I did think it's... but like i said it it um i think shores of tripoli goes just above time of crisis okay yeah i like it so more under than time my mark 44 above time of crisis how the hell did the second world war hakapale end up in front of memoir that's wrong on several <laughs> levels that game is so bad I, we need to uh someone earmark you put it that in there for by 20... yourself I know I did, and we need, to, and it's like just because it's a more impressive undertaking. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh! It's Someone so should have caught I see that on Facebook. December. I see these Second World War games, just like they're expensive, and I see people I selling them so on much. Facebook Marketplace for all this money, and not just that one, but all of them. And I just, I just sort of laugh every time. I think of you. <laughs> oh, mine will be joining them soon. All right, Shorts of Tripoli, fifty six, and it, God, we need an intern. Um, but the best intern in war game podcasting is already taken. Patrick, someone please remind. No, Patrick. <laughs> yeah, Patrick, you're the new Braxton. <laughs> someone honestly remind me that when December comes around, just remind me that the Second World War Hakapale is way overrated. Like the more I think about it, it's like Zeppelin Raider levels. It's so bad. <laughs> All right, so the last one is Attack Sub. Yeah. Um, this is like right on. I really don't like Time of Crisis. <laughs> and Nate and Brandon were playing it at the meetup today. Mm-hmm. And I'm, n- I'm never going to like poo poo someone's game like while they're playing it. I want to be like, oh, this game <laughs> sucks. I do like a lot of the mechanics, but I've made my com- like I there's so much I dislike about that game. I like the deck building. I played it one time here. I, I play actually played it here at my house. I had people over. We played it. I played it one time and sold it the next week. <laughs> Oh, man. The guy that won the game, like, <laughs> all he did was, like, fend off barbarians the whole game. Like, he never took any land or anything, but he got all these victory points from just fighting barbarians. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, got me all hot and bothered on Time of Crisis. That needs to go down, too. That's below Zeppelin. No, no. no it's worse. Okay. All right. We're focused on attack sub here's the problem. Going into today, I think I had attack sub higher, yeah. but then I played up front. And up front, I know, I know, I just read the designer's quote. What's the purpose of this game? Mm-hmm. It's fast playing. It's light. Yada yada yada. So, so doesn't that lend a quick comparison to Memoir Forty Four? Then, same audience, same kind of game. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, really, what I think it it's man, I just had such a bad. <laughs> memoir experiences <laughs> see i just got uh, done playing memoir 44 like 25 times in a month with patrick so oh uh, yeah but i'm board game arena, oh yeah so every game is better when you don't have to set it up or put it away <laughs> you know it's, uh, i think memoir is better so then it's is it better or worse than shores of tripoli i mean if with- if it's like tank duel which obviously different games but then I would say it's probably better because Tank Duel, eh, it's not great. I sold it, but you know. I mean, up front blows them both out of the water. Um, I will put it. So here's here's my deal with here's my deal with Shores of Tripoli. The back half of Shores of Tripoli is very fun. Other than it kind of follows right the same sure. path. And that Attack was my sub. biggest complaint overall with Shores of Tripoli. Is it just it felt very samey starting on about the third game. Yeah, and it, again, it but that back half, the first few times you go through it, is actually really cool. Yeah. Um, attack sub is just like, all right, let's see what happens when our ships clash into each other. 
I will. This is tough because it's really split in here. So they're both under memoir. Just because I know when we get to up front on the list, it's going to be so much higher. I'm going to put attack sub below Shores of Tripoli. All right. I mean, they're, you're really splitting hairs. Do you want to? I was going to say, do you want a naval game? But they're both naval games. <laughs> <laughs> nope. There All right. Go. Awesome stuff. Sweet. Um, whoops. I got a blank <laughs> in. U.S. Civil War just dropped to three. <laughs> Something's going on here. Who's hacking this list? Sorry, we're having formatting problems. <laughs> All right, I think we're at 64. The problem was I was editing the list in another window. Yeah. So if we started tonight at 59, we should be at 64. We have 64. Okay. Good. There hey, we go. That's some good brackets right there. 64. Right. Seth no Raider versus U.S. Civil War. Go. <laughs> hmm. Someone, Patrick posted his shelfie today, and John R. made a comment about... Yeah. Um, me disapproving of his collection and i said no you can own 10 copies oh my gosh patrick ordered a copy of u.s civil war while we were <laughs> recording sorry i just popped into the discord to, um i i said no you can have 10 copies of zeppelin raider as long as you own one copy of u.s civil war you're in the clear no matter what else you own actually you can own and enjoy whatever the hell you want i don't really care okay rick rich Yes. 64 games have been ranked. How right. many more do we have to go? Well, we can. We got choice because, you know, we've got freedom. We can either do 64 more or we can stop when we have played every single game that we own. It's never going to end. Hope not. Yeah, me too. All right. So, folks, how do you get a game on this list? Well, you can be like Kevin Bertram and you can be awesome and you can go support our Patreon and you get to pick a game if you back at a certain level. I love. I teased this last month. I love Kevin's pick, and I, I I did tell him. I said, "Hey, we're doing short game extravaganza, so don't waste your pick on Shores of Tripoli." Not that like it's worth talking about Shores of Tripoli. That's not what I meant. But I'm like, we're already doing it, mm -hmm. so don't. Um, and he picked a great one. One I've always wanted to play. It's Milton Bradley game, Fortress America. Yeah, old school. Wolverines. I mean, recommended is Wolverines, right? But um, <laughs> for, uh, it's got to be yeah. the the OG, not the new one. I haven't seen the new one. Yeah, neither have I. I don't. I don't think it's uh, it's worth it. Yeah. So, if you don't want to be like Kevin, but you do want to support our show, um, you can vote in our monthly poll. And we, I got away from this, but um, you can go to our patreon.com slash history table, support our show. Uh, improve our recording stuff do cool like help out the cool prizes for the every war game ever bracket for everyone who picked a prediction they're gonna pr not everyone who picked the winner gets a prize uh for cool things like that and you can be awesome like doug r it's kind of a big deal and he uh he supports the show nice so thanks doug and thank you everyone else who supports the show uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna do like a list of uh, a running list of everyone who uh Support the show. Give him a little shout out. So thanks, Doug. And thanks, Kevin. Now, if you're like Doug or if you're like any of our other patrons, you get to vote in our monthly poll. And so how this works is Rich and I come up with a list of games. But more importantly, we stump for one game in particular and encourage you, our patrons, to go vote for that game in our monthly poll. So this will go up when the episode goes up. You'll have a few days to vote. And this decides what game we will rank in February. All right, I already talked about how we're playing it. We don't have coin representation on this list. February's yeah, pick it's kind of has hard to, to believe, be, but yeah, it's true. A distant plane. All right, simple as that. There you go. I all wouldn't right, argue Rich. with that at all, since obviously I'm playing it in a couple weeks. But I actually threw up a different one on there. Um, we've talked about blind swords, and one of the we always talk about it in the context of the U.S. Civil War, and those are great. But actually, one of my maybe my favorite blind swords game is actually at any cost Mets 1870. So it's a game between France and I don't know if they're called Germany. They didn't become Germany till after they won the war. But France and Prussia or France and Germany or whoever. And uh, yeah, so Patrick and I are actually going to start playing that one next week. And I would love to have that be our game. So there we go. Everyone, it's Matt. I apologize, but just with how timing of editing the podcast and the patron vote poll ran, we already know February's featured game. The votes are in, and we will be featuring at any cost Mets from GMT Games. All right, back to the show. Awesome. So if you want a distant plane or an any cost Mets or something else from a list of, I don't know, five, six, seven, eight options, something like that, 
go and vote. So next month we'll be playing one of those games. We're also going to be playing Fortress America, thanks to Kevin, uh, the Milton Bradley Classic. You have that to look forward to in February. Nice. All right. All right. Uh, no other listener comments or questions this month, folks. But if you want to stick around for all the other stuff where history is off the table, now is the time when Rich and I talk about all the other nonsense yeah. uh, that we enjoy. If all you care about is war games, see you next month. Hold on. I do have one quick comment. Oh, okay. um, Rex, let me know that if you want to play – I'm so mad about this. If you want to play Pacific War Solo on Vassal, don't pick a side, but pick the referee. Yeah, and then you sense. don't have to keep switching sides like I did for a month. Oh, that's right. You did say that's why you did it. Yeah. Yeah. So a little tidbit there. If you plan on playing it on Vassal Solo, you can take that route and be smarter about your Vassal experience than myself. Now yeah. we're done talking war games. All right. Hold on. Before you get to what you have listed <laughs> first, I need to ask you if you are all right. If I'm all right? If you are all right. If you and Mitch and Nate and Patrick are all doing okay. Why do you ask that? I was so excited that you guys had caught the Magic the Gathering bug. Oh, okay, yeah. Because that meant that I would be able to play Commander with you guys, which is not on Magic the Gathering Arena. Right. Arena is like an MTG poison counter. And I think we need to just discuss and acknowledge yeah, so, the arena i mean honestly i'm just you know i've been playing for i mean obviously i guess it's been less than a month because we it's, it's after our last recording right or at least our i think you had started recording. then because you played okay. a match before we started recording last time oh okay all right so oh that's right i played with mitch but before our regular recording so in any case yeah. i mean honestly the I, I'm sure that there are plenty of toxic people on there, but just kind of as a newbie, um, they're not really bothering me. They do. I mean, people can't really bother you too much. There's not too much yeah. chat. I mean, if, if I get, I'm not, I'm not ranked high enough to be running into like the super powered decks. I mean, there are certain decks that just sort of annoy me. Like if somebody, like if it's the round three and they have not played any, uh, any, any creatures, all they've done is counter every one of my spells. I'll just concede because I'm not going to sit here for 30 minutes and play that. I don't care right. that much. So right. it doesn't, I don't let it bother me. So I'm not too worried about it. No, I, I mean, I made what? it up to like, I don't know, gold or whatever's diamond, maybe level just by playing a lot of games. Mostly I just, I play my dailies every morning to get the 500 or 750 XP. And then if you play a few games of the course of the day with you guys. I love it, and it's awesome. Sorry, my toxic comment, that's an old mechanic that's actually coming back in yeah, Magic Together. Yeah, I saw that. I saw that's where you get back. a toxic counter. Um, no, what I one thing I do love about Arena is that it doesn't have chat, yeah. and I am allowed to play the degenerate things that I wouldn't play like at a <laughs> table with you guys when we're playing Commander. Yeah. Um, I do think it's awesome. I My hope, honestly, is like I like Arena fine. I like 60 card magic fine. My favorite experience still is to sit down with four buddies and play a game of commander that's heavy in interaction and heavy in negotiation yeah. and discussions. Not that every card you play has to be talked about, right. but when you can be like, hey, Rich, if we don't do something, Mitch is going to pop off. If I do this, will you not, like, if I do this, that'll help the table. Will you not attack me next turn? Like, when those interactions come out and you just have fun with buddies, like, that's what I want this to uh, eventually, like, turn yes. into. So I'm looking forward to doing that in a couple weeks with you guys. Yeah. I have zero interest in ever going to Miniature Market or Game Night and playing in person. Zero. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like, that's, even that's if fine. I had cards, which the only cards, well, I have a couple starter commander decks, but um, all, all my cards are on Arena, so I can't play them in person anyway. But even if somebody just dropped a big crate of cards on me, I would not be interested in going up and playing in person. Like, by playing in person, you mean with, like, random people? Yes, yes. Yeah. Because yeah. we're, we're actually, um, Carl um is is uh, has proposed an event. I got to go in there on the Sorkfest stuff and get it set up. 
um, a little friendly draft experience with with some older sets. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would I would play fun. in person with with people that I right at yeah. least at least had some degree of knowledge of, but. Right. You're not going to have a bad experience. It's casual. It's right. fun. And that's what I like about Command. And I'm kind of in the same boat because Commander can be a pile of jank to competitive EDH, mm-hmm. um, co- competitive Commander. And like you can go to a game store and people will show up with their competitive decks and you're just like, uh, I'm playing Rich Tribal and every art every artist on my deck is from an artist named rich like, <laughs> you know and like this guy's like showing up with something that wins on like turn three yeah. and so there's such a high degree of variance that i actually think it's it's better and more important to play with people that one you like and two like you have that discussion like i'm not gonna sit down against your starter deck with like my favorite deck because yeah. it's just it, like it's not a good experience for you so i I'm, i actually like i'm right there with you as much as i like it i'm not going to go to that either yeah but like mitch and i played so it's what's it brawl which is Historic the closest brawl. they yep. have to commander mm-hmm. so and like this is literally like the first time i played with my brawl deck and like i'm going like every time i get draw a new card i'm like ooh, i've never seen that card before yes and this is yeah. my deck <laughs> right but I am finding the deck building to be a lot more fun than I thought I would like it. Like the first time I ever put together my own deck with no outside assistance, I was like, hey, this is cool. I did this myself and it's fun to play. And I actually have another one that I did net deck that's like, it's also fun to play. It's like the exact, the only reason I did it because I wanted something the exact opposite, but I still like going back to the one that I made. But it is kind oh, yeah. of, like I'll play someone else and I'll see a cool card that they do and I'll look up that card and be like, ooh, if I have that, I'm like, well, how can I build a deck around that card? That looks fun. Yeah, that's how a lot of my brawl de- historic brawl decks are. Yeah. Like my standard decks, if I want to do well, which again, I don't really care um, on that deck because I don't have time. Now, I do have, because Mitch gave me a hard time, and folks, <laughs> net decking is just, it's 100% acceptable and no one's got time for that. I did make a deck that was like, all right, I'm going to do these awesome cards and not uh, take the grief. But yeah, I agree with you. I do also like that deck more. Um, and Arena, and I I like building 100 cards singleton more than like a 60 card deck. Like way more. Yeah, I can see that. And there's more... Just because you get to put all your cool shit in. Like, oh, this moose, um, Olvenwad Oddity is one of my favorite cards in Magic. It's not good, but it's a moose. Right. And I'm going to jam <laughs> it in every single deck that I can because it's ridiculous. Rather than finding your favorite card and putting four of it in so you make sure you get to see it every game. Right. But if it's... Well, no, if I put four cards in a 60-card deck, it's four bad cards taking up four slots. <laughs> but like here, it's just like, oh, it's a one-off. And if I drop it and it does this thing, that's cool. But so... <laughs> You know, one time when we did a feedback poll, someone's like, I don't like the magic talk. <laughs> you know, sorry, folks, because now it's not just me. Well, but again, it, the it'll always podcast be in the back ended here. 10 minutes ago. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. What do you, if you don't like this part, what are you still here? Because here's what, here's what we have left, folks. We have fantasy books uh, and we have trick takers. Okay. So really, the war game talk is done. But we hope you're here um, for all the other stuff. It's been fun. It's been like hilarious. Like, lunch lunchtime duel lunchtime duel yeah Hell yeah yeah and friday night magic too which i haven't played yet um but i know some people have been doing it yeah so that'll be the cool thing with if if we can get spell table up and running with four people that's that's our opportunity to if you find you really like commander you don't have to go to a game sort we just point our cameras at our desks mm-hmm. and that gives you like a platform to play on you can click a picture on my camera like a card like oh what's that card matt has and it'll pull it up for you yeah and tell you what that card does so it's pretty cool cool nice yeah uh awesome i love that um also arena is free like you can spend money on it of course i love that uh, Paul bought an avatar, <laughs> but nothing else in the game. <laughs> I got, I got the uh, like the the free one or whatever from the like the guy with the hood on it. So sure, sure, sure. Uh nice. That's that's magic talk. It we'll is funny though, because like I'll start a game and like if it's some avatar I've never seen before, I'm like, okay, I'm dead. <laughs> <laughs> so all right, let's uh, let's have a little fun with it. Like, what are your what's your favorite? Color combination or, or so, mono color? So my like favorite, the deck that I made myself is a mono green deck. Oh, yeah. Um, which I'm just loving because, and it's it's really built around two cards, which I have four of each one of them in there. But one is the, uh, 
I don't, they're both those, those three turn enchantment cards. Okay. Sagas. Yeah. Yeah. So th- I like both of those. And one of them basically lets me play an extra land. So it gets more green cards out there, more lands out there. And uh-huh. the other one is like called branch of Bozeju or whatever. So yep. he, he turns into a, a creature that is powered by lots of lands. And then I have a few other cards in there that sort of do the same thing. Some of them are milling and I have get, get bonus or having hands in my graveyard. I've got this armor card that gives me a plus 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 for every land forest that I have. So like I, there's been several times I've had that deck out there and I've had like three 2020 creatures out there on the board. So awesome. Yeah. And, and it, it doesn't take that long to develop because I've got some, some fast stuff in there, especially with death touch, which I find to be really useful. Um, but because of those two saga cards, I can get a lot of lands out there really quickly. And my, my, uh, planeswalker she helps me get lands out there too nice yeah so there is a card that's the one i play the most or that i like that i i am i really like green green is especially in commander one of the uh strongest um is probably the strongest color yeah. um there is a card that's currently legal and standard um it is called and you might have it um it's definitely a rare it is a colossal colossus. Dang it! No, I'm talking about Titan of Industry. Are you? No, I love Titan of That's Industry a good though. One too. There's, um, I have one card that gives me like plus three, plus three. I think that's called Colossal something. Basically, what it does is when it comes onto the bat, its power and toughness is equal to the amount of lands you control, so it fits mm-hmm. in your deck. When you drop it on the battlefield, you put a land onto the battlefield from your hand, and then you draw a card. And then you repeat that until you run out of lands. So Holy you play a land, draw a card, play a land, draw a card. play, And they all come in tapped, but like if you have enough lands, you could drop yeah. five lands after playing him, and he's like a 15 Yeah, because tap doesn't matter when I've got things that are powered by number of lands. Yeah, that right, would, right. that'd be nice. I'll have to look at the name from him. He's, it's like a giant dinosaur, too. It's a pretty sweet card. <laughs> Anyways, all right. That's awesome. I'm glad you guys are enjoying it. I think it's cool. You like green. Green's yeah. uh, my favorite color as well. Yeah, and it's cool. I like I I that that neck deck. I want to. I did a red one. It's like super fast. Um, yeah. But I just wanted wins. something that was the exact opposite, which is kind of the only thing I have not played much of at all is black, which I'm intrigued by because I've played against some black decks that were just, you know, awful to play against. Like not boring, but um, you know, hard to play against. So sure, I sure. kind of want to play something black just to see how it works. Awesome. Okay. You are reading Between Two Fires. I am. We're about maybe two-thirds, three-quarters of the way we're done with it. So I know Jason, this was like his book of the year last year. You mm-hmm. talked about it. So, yeah, we're reading it now, and it's 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 wild. It's good. <laughs> have you have you gotten to the part, and this isn't a – I'll say, have you gotten to, like, the dinner party part? <laughs> with the monkeys? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. That was such a. Yes. I was we were so reading that, immersed. looking at each other, and eventually we got to the part where, like, this is a dream, right? <laughs> I'll yeah. edit that part out. I don't want it to be a spoiler. Okay, yeah. It was just so immersive. <laughs> it's so good, uh, yeah. I love that part. Oh, it was so creepy. Oh, there's just, there's certain lines in the book that are just so good, too. We had one in the last, I think it was the last chapter recently, but there was. The priest that the, she's been like walking around with, and then there was another priest that they met up with, and the two priests were talking about the girl, and and the one says to the other, he goes, "You know she's not what she seems to be, right?" And then the priest that's friendly to her, he goes, "Yeah, I know." And then the other priest goes, "She seems to be from God," <laughs> mm. and it was just so creepy the way he said it. It was so good. <laughs> oh yeah, that that book rocks. That's yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Uh, sweet. I was gonna talk about trick diggers. I don't need to. I'll just say that we played Cat in the Box, and that was a. I never awesome... heard of that one. Is okay, it... Cat in the Box is a trick taker that plays like a lot of trick takers, but you don't know the color of the card until you play it, and then you kind of like check it off. Like, all right, this is now a yellow four, and then that blocks off the yellow floor. And you can say like, Rich, if you lead green, I can say I don't have any green. But so this four I'm playing is a yellow four, not a green four. But then later on, if I'm ever in a position where I would like have to play a green four because I have another four, it like creates a paradox and you lose a bunch of points. It's uh, huh. it's probably one of the best trick takers, recent trick takers I've played recently. It's called uh, Cat in the Box. You playing that on BGA or? No, no, we have a copy. We played oh, okay. with my in-laws. Okay. 
So how do you keep Super. track of that? Like, if there's you... like a board you mark it. Okay. Like, it sounds like how would you possibly keep track of that? Yeah. But actually, it's it's really intuitive once you play it. Like, okay. it, it works. It works well. Nice. Yeah. All right. You got anything else? <sighs> no, but we're gonna have so much to talk about next month. That's gonna be awesome. Oh my gosh, our lineup is is dope. Yeah. So it'll be a good time. Absolutely. All right, folks. That's gonna do it for us. Uh, thank you for listening to the show. Thank you for hanging out on our Discord. If you need a link to our Discord, there is a link in the show notes. There's a link to our website. There's a link has, to Historic Fest coming this August. Uh, like I said, in our end of the year show, it's time to start ramping up work on Historic Fest. And keep an eye out on the Historical Board Game Awards. There will be a lot of stuff uh, coming out about that soon. Uh, if you have any questions, you can shoot us an email, historytablepodcast at gmail.com. You can find us on other places on the internet, but as Rich always says, the Discord is best. Absolutely. That's the best place to find us. For sure. That's going to do it for us, folks. Say it. <laughs> sorry. What? <laughs> Nothing, sorry. Oh, that's all right. All right. Good night, folks. Good night, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>